Good morning. Welcome to the first small tutorial of this Hawkeye conference. Thank you for coming. Uh, what we have in store for you, what Jack has in store for you now, is something completely different. And so it's not going to be yet another, let's say, the latest counting story. It's not even going to be traditional model behavior. I don't know when I first got to know Jack, but every time we've interacted, I see the Irish twinkle in his eye, a smile, and there's always a little bit of philosophy and a lot of science in our conversations when we're not talking about people. <laughs> Jack uh, went to uh, college at Yale, um, much in the uh, surprise and shock, going east to one of these horrible establishments uh, on his parents, and majored in physics, which will explain a little bit about him to you. Um, and uh, after, after Yale, he went to uh, SUNY Stony Brook, because he heard of a lot of good people that were there, wasn't quite sure he wanted to go on to physics and fell in uh, to the clinical psychology program. But meanwhile, he took a class, amongst others, from Howie Rathman. And Howie introduced him to action law. And, and all of a sudden, this not quite dormant part of his brain that used to do physics, said, equations in psychology? Well, that is cool. And so he took more classes from Howie and wound up uh, moving into his laboratory at the same time that uh, Ben Green was there. Um, I, uh, I, I remember the first, first bit of research of Jack, and I'm talking about Jack McDowell, here we'll be presenting in a minute. One of the first bits of research I saw of his, which was one of the best outreaches for quantitative analysis of behavior to the general population. And that was an article in the American Psychologist on the application of Bernstein's uh, hyperbola, Einstein's uh, hyperbolic natural law, uh, to clinical populations and the implications of Parsifal and K for how treatment might be affected. I thought, whoa, that is very, very cool. And then there's always a bit of a contrarian in Jack. Uh, I remember papers on the natural law, and he came up with a linear system theory of the, the natural law. Slightly esoteric. Uh, he was teaching TA for Howie, and an undergraduate engineer uh, was taking the class, and they put their heads together to develop this transfer function for behavior. Uh, but the thing that he's devoted himself mostly to in the last dozen years uh, has been the evolutionary theory of behavior. And it's hard to study evolution and behavior because evolution takes a long time, and behavior doesn't take so long. And so he's done it through computer simulations using plausible genetics and being able to show that, well, I'm starting to tell his story now, and I shouldn't be doing that. And so, Jack, uh, I look forward to find for an overview of what you've been doing and maybe some of the latest details now. My history there. It was a great history for me. Um, yes, so I'm going to be talking about a uh, theory of behavior dynamics uh, that's based on an evolutionary algorithm. This I call the Gang of Ten. They have been instrumental in contributing to this research for 15 years or more. Make us some of them. Uh, and I just want to emphasize that it's not all me that's done this. They contributed to the theory and also to the uh, empirical testing of the theory, which of course is so important. Uh, here's an outline of the talk I'm going to give today. I'm going to describe the evolutionary theory and then give some qualitative and quantitative evidence that supports the theory. And uh, I will talk about implementing punishment in the theory because that's something that we just did recently uh, and uh, it has worked out very well. We have problems with it for years and years, but it now works out quite well. 
Uh, four and five, I'm going to touch on briefly to, to the extent that I have time about the correspondence of the theory to material reality, because as you'll see, you'll have questions about that. How does this correspond to the real world? I'm, I'm talking about the things that I talk about. And then also um, uh, the relevance of the theory to applied behavior analysis. I will say that number four, the correspondence of the theory to material reality, I'll be talking about in more detail this afternoon at four o'clock. Right, right in one of these rooms here uh, in a symposium. And then the relevance of the theory to applied behavior analysis, there's a whole symposium on Monday at 10, also in one of these rooms here, about the application of the evolutionary theory to severe problem behavior. So don't, um, don't miss that if you're interested in those, uh, those applications. And I am a licensed clinical psychologist myself. I'm very interested in applications, clinical applications, and uh, so uh, these, these things are interesting to me, the extent of, to which the theory can be helpful. And now I'm talking about future directions. Um, and I'm going to leave some time for questions at the end, so, so take some notes if you want to ask questions, or if there's something that I really haven't been clear about as I go along, you can interrupt, raise your hand, and, on, and, and I can answer questions there. In order to talk about this theory, I have to talk about complex systems. A complex system is a, is a system that has a number of elements that follow simple rules, and when those simple rules are followed, emergent outcomes appear. A good example of a, a complex system is a murmuration of starlings. Uh, and I, uh, I hope this is going to work here. Here you see the murmuration of starlings, and they are they take all these different shapes, different densities as they file on the flock of these birds, and but there's no external force that's causing them. There's no hawk that's chasing them, or sometimes a hawk will chase them, and they'll cause some perturbations at the edge, which then uh, uh, promulgate through the through the flock itself. Um, there, uh, but people have tried to model this, and they model it saying that each bird follows simple rules. The main, the main rule is, or there are two rules. One is, don't collide with your neighbors. And the other is, stay with the flock. And if the birds do that, then they produce these emergent outcomes. By the way, the simple rules of a complex system like this, can't, can't, you can't build outcomes into those rules, nor can you predict the outcomes from just examining the rules. In order to see what the rules produce, you have to actually run the rules. So this is a great example of complex system. They're governed by a, a low-level rules that produce emergent structure and people often talk about it as being self-organization, the flock organizes itself, or whatever the system is organizes itself. So if you have a complex system, you can develop complexity theories that describe the, the theories about the complex system, and the theories are statements of low-level rules that govern the system and cause it to self-organize and exhibit emergent structure. So I'm going to talk about adaptive behavior as a complex system governed by low-level rules. And uh, as you suspect, I'm going to say that I'm going to suggest that the rules are the rules of evolution. And many people have suggested for a long time that behavior evolves in this, in ontogenetic time, that is during the lifetime of an individual organism, under the selection pressure of consequences from the environment. And I'll mention some of the individuals in a minute who talked about this kind of thing. So if that's the case, then we could, we could implement the rules of the behavioral system as selection, and I'll show you how that works in a minute, recombination and mutation. Those would be the rules of how evolution occurs in a population of behaviors. These are some individuals who have talked about this sort of thing when they talk, talk about, these guys have talked about how, how the brain may work by evolutionary principles. That's J.W. Pringle, who's right in 1950, a British zoologist. That's Friedrich Hayek, an Austrian uh, Nobel laureate economist. And that's Gerald Bentman, most recently, who won the Nobel Prize along with a couple of other people for figuring out how the immune system worked, then turned to neuroscience and uh, studied this idea that the brain works by uh, evolutionary principles, wrote a book called Neural Darwinism, and, and uh, all of them have that general idea. Now, you'll find that, uh, well, I'll talk about that a little bit later. So how do we implement these uh, rules in, the, in for the evolutionary theory? Well, we have a population of potential behaviors and this population undergoes selection, recombination, and mutation. One behavior is emitted from the population at random at each tick of time. That behavior comes out into the world. It can be observed and measured 
just like you would mention the behavior of a live organism. There's a key pack, and then next there's a key pack on the other side, and next there's an air pack, and next it goes to the back of the box. So there's always some behavior that's occurring. And those are the behaviors that are admitted by the population. How do we represent behaviors in the evolutionary theory? Well, we represent them by phenotypes or by integer values, let's say from 0 to 1023, which you see over here. And we call these integer values of phenotypes. And then each phenotype has a bit of binary representation, which I have over here, the binary binary representation of 0, 723, and 1023, and we call these the genotypes of the, uh, of the behaviors. So we can take a population of behaviors that you see right here that go, the phenotype is along the bottom from 0 to 1023, which is our typical range, and I put 100 behaviors selected at random to start with into the population, and I can define target classes, which I have indicated here and here, which are uh, classes that go from, let's say, 490 to 512, and 513 to 540, or something like that. Those can be left and right key packs, left and right level presses, or any other kind of target that you'd like to have. And so I can use those very, and notice that there is more than one, one integer, one phenotype in each class, meaning there are different ways that you can that you can produce that behavior. So you can press the left lever, left paw, right paw, uh, rearing up over the uh, lever, and so on. So they're different, different to, Topologies of the behavior that are possible here. So that's basically the, the setup. Let's look at the rules. No. Okay. The rules, the emission rule I've already talked about. Uh, behavior is emitted at random at each tick of time. That's the behavior you, you observe. Once the, the behavior is emitted, you have to create a whole new population for the next generation. And to do that, you've got to select parent behaviors. So we select 100 pairs of parent behaviors. We usually deal with populations of 100 kids. 100 pairs of parent behaviors, which recombine to produce 100 child behaviors. With uh, there's the reproduction rule. I'll explain these in more detail in a minute. And once we have 100 child behaviors, we add a little bit of mutation to the population. That's the new population, and then a new behavior is emitted at random. That's how the whole thing, how the whole thing works. The selection rule is important because it implements a selection. If a target behavior produces a benefit to the organism, then parents from chosen from the population such that they are similar, and I have to really understand the mathematics, they're similar to the behavior that just produced the benefit. If you have parents that are similar to that behavior, their offspring will be similar to that behavior also. So when the, the behavior produces a benefit, parents are chosen so that they're like the behavior that just produced the benefit which causes child behaviors to be close to that value, and consequently they'll build up in the population near and at the target value, so it'll be more likely to be emitted in the future. That's how selection works. Um, but if the target behavior doesn't produce a benefit to the organism, then parents are selected at random, choice at random, produce the next generation. Um, so uh, that's the selection rule, and here is uh, this should be combination. There's, there's one pair of parents, the father behavior and the mother behavior, 235 and 115, and those are their primary representations. We just take a bit at random from the father or the mother for each bit in the child, and that's the child behavior. And trust me when I tell you the children resemble the parents when, they're, when there's a recombination in this way. So the parents that are close to the target behavior do produce children, the child behaviors that are close to the target behavior. And then once I have uh, the, 100 new child behaviors, I add a little bit of mutation to the population. And uh, that is, I pick a certain percentage of uh, behaviors at random from the population, like 10%, which we often use. And for each behavior that undergoes mutation, I will flip a bit at random. Right here, this bit, you can see the uh, mark. This bit gets flipped from, one to, from 0 to 1, and the phenotype changes from 723 to 731. And that's why I add a little bit of mutation to the um, so here's a general summary of how it works. There's an initial population, a behavior is emitted at random. If there's a benefit to the organism, selection occurs, meaning parents are chosen on the basis of fitness, which is how close they are to the phenotype of the behavior that just produced a benefit. If there's no benefit, the parents are chosen at random. In either case, there's recombination, reproduction by recombination and mutation is added, and that can be the subsequent population from which a new behavior is emitted, and that just keeps going on. As much as you would like, and you can put these you can put these organisms in, in, in any environment that you want. Um, this is a very simple theory I want to emphasize, and it's simple enough that you can explain it to your friends. 
on a napkin down at the Starbucks. <laughs> Andre Popa, a former graduate student of mine, in fact drew the theory on, on a napkin down at the Starbucks. And you can see it's all present here. Here are phenotypes, 6OA, here's the genotype. This shows selection when, when a benefit occurs. This shows recombination and this shows mutation. So you have a random emission of behavior here, followed by selection if, there, if, if, if it produces a behavior that benefits the organism, and then recombination, mutation, and new generation, and that's it. This is a very simple theory. There's nothing more to the theory than this. There's no funny, there's no funny business going on under the hood here to make the results come out in any, in any particular way. It also tells an appealing story about behavior, namely that it evolves in ontogenetic time in response to consequences from the environment. Well, that's the story that it tells. The question is, um, th does it work? Does it describe behavior accurately? How does the behavior of artificial organisms uh, that are animated by this theory compare to the behavior of live organisms? What's the evidence supporting the theory? If the artificial organisms behave just like the live organisms in that environment, that's evident that, that's evidence that the theory is correct. Okay, let's take something straightforward like uh, cumulative records. Here are three RI schedules in RI10, in RI40, in RI70. This shows uh, a single artificial organism on each one. And you see we get nice steady response rates as we do with live organisms. It's not completely perfect. Here's a little bit of a pause down here, a little bit of a slow down here, which we also see in live organisms. And you can see that the response rate, the slope of the line, is, is, is steeper for the RI10 than for the RI70, which is what we also see in live organisms. Now, if I take a, if I take a uh, whole series of these, run a whole series of RI schedules, calculate their response rates and the reinforcement rates, and plot the response rates against the reinforcement rates, what function form should I see? Come on, who's doing this? Hyperbola, uh, that's the function form you should see. And OMG. <laughs> there are two artificial organisms, and we have much more data than this. And there's the inside hyperbola right here. The asymptote is K. R sub E governs the rapidity with which the hyperbola approaches this asymptote. The x axis shows reinforcement rate, the y axis shows response rate. And that's a good description. That's a pretty good description. It's not perfect, but it's not perfect in live organisms either. It's very, very, very close. How is this possible? I just have these four little theories on these four little rules on a napkin that are shooting out behavior. How how does it come out? Why does it come out like this? Why isn't it an exponential? Why isn't it a straight line? Why isn't it just random numbers all over the place? I don't know. It comes out exactly like this. Uh, what happened? What would happen if I had uh, individual schedules on two alternatives? Of, and so I had a concurrent RI RI schedule, and I looked at the ratio of, of response rates plotted against the ratio of reinforcement. What should I see then? The coordinates are, uh, well, if we could take, I don't want to give it in, but let's say I, the, the coordinates are the ratio, the, the y axis is the ratio of response rates and the x axis is the ratio of reinforcement rates. It's linear. It'll be linear in logarithmic transformation. Power Power function is the GML, the generalized matching law. That's what's supposed to happen. That's what happens with live organisms. And when you take the law of transformation of the GML, the generalized matching law, you get a straight line. And that's typically how we do the fits. So what happens when you run artificial organisms? Oops. Oh my goodness. That's exactly what you get. Here's the power function matching right here. Here's the law of transformation of power function matching. Here are four AOs. They're supposed to fall on that straight line, the data points. It's pretty good. I don't know if you can see the R squares 0 0.98, 1 0.0, 0 0.99, 0 0.98. There's no error variance to speak of in these organisms. Uh, it's, there's no bias here. We can deal with bias, but I'm not going to talk about that today. And you probably can't see these, but we can look at the exponents from the fits. It's 0 0.84, 0 0.80, 0 0.82, 0 0.76. It's very close to what we often get in experiment, experiments with live organisms, those experiments. Okay, let's look at changeover patterns on concurrent schedules. We just change back and forth on concurrent schedules. This is now off an LF for six birds. And what this shows is that when the, when the 
reinforcement frequencies are the same on the two sides, you get the, more, the greatest number of change overs. This is the change over rate. When they're very different, favoring the numerator, you get fewer change overs. When they favor the denominator, you also get fewer change overs, and that's how change overs work. If you look at the AOs, they produce the same kind of structure. Now, here's something even more complicated, and that is if I vary both the rate of reinforcement and the magnitude of reinforcement. Uh, and so I have a uh, uh, more complicated kind of situation. Do you know what, what kind of answer I should get for that? It's called the concatenated matching law right here. And the concatenated matching law has a uh, factor that entails the response, the reinforcement rates, that's the first factor on the right. The factor that entails the magnitudes, that's the second factor on the right. Each has a different exponent. And you can fit this in local week transformation also, in which case you get a plane. Here are the planes in gray. Uh, this is, you don't really have to know this in great detail, uh, but you can study it if you, if you like. But um, you see the data points are data points from four artificial organisms, and they fall right on that plane. In other words, their behavior is governed by the concatenated matching law with a high degree of precision. The R squares are uh, very high. Can you see them here? The R squares are quite high. Um, and also, the exponents, interestingly, the A sub R exponent is about 0.8, which is what we expect. And the A sub M exponent is about 0.6, which we also expect from experiments with live organisms that, that behavior is, choice is less sensitive to magnitude differences than to rate differences. And that's what we see in these days. Hey, this is this little theory, this is this little theory on a napkin. It's no more complicated than that, and it produces these very complicated outcomes. Why? I don't know, but that's the result of the There's nothing special. Well, I'll tell you why in a second. But the good reason why it's really remarkable to see all this happen. I was just astonished when I first saw the hyperbola. I was in Miami, I'll never forget it. I was in my sister in law's condo. I was running these studies. Sometimes you run these studies overnight, then you come back in the morning. If you're doing a whole series of them, come back in the morning and see what you got. And I, I looked there and saw the hyperbola for the first time. I mean, yeah, hyperbola for the first time. It's truly amazing. These are really amazing results from this very simple theory. These are all emergent structures from the theory. They're emergent outcomes of all the movements of the, of the murmuration star are, are emergent. They're not present in the rules. They emerge from the rules. Furthermore, interestingly, because these evolutionary rules produce these outcomes, they constitute a theory for these complicated equations. These equations don't have a theory. They're empirical equations. Now they have a theory. Why do we get these? Because they're a consequence of evolutionary dynamics, one could say, I'd like to say. Um, so that's a lot of evidence supporting the evolutionary theory. I'll point to evidence. But there's more. Let's look at a behavior on concurrent ratio schedules. Uh, with unequal ratio schedules in the components, there's strong preference for the smaller ratio. Um, that's, uh, which is what we find, and that's not what this figure shows. For the artificial organisms, when the ratios are unequal, there's strong preference for the smaller ratio, which is what we find in, in like, organism behavior. If the ratios are the same, then if they're small enough, you get preference for one or the other. This is an RR5 in both components. They're small enough and equal. If you get preference, a strong preference for one or the other, they just get stuck on it, even though they both pay, pay off the same way. But if the ratios are larger, the equal ratios are larger, like an R of 60, then you don't get strong preference, and you go to the switching back and forth. This is exactly the result reported by Herman Stead for R of So we could say um, that um, the, what these results show is that Support with the argument that the behavior we observe and measure is generated by evolutionary dynamics. These are emergent outcomes of the evolutionary dynamics and consequently, consequently constitute theories for these quantitative results. Um, let's try something a little more complicated and on a smaller scale. Let's sit down with the right here with us. Arrange uh, uh, concurrent schedules in a single session. Numbers of concurrent schedules in a single session without discriminatory stimulus. And so you just started on one, and you didn't know which one you were on. You had to respond on it for a while to see what the, how, how the reinforcement rates were distributed across the two. 
This is solely to Rebecca, but who's a graduate student of mine a while back. And she said, um, uh, well, let's look at what you, the outcome that you get. What happens is this shows a single bird, and uh, this shows the uh, response rate ratio. And here, for 1 to 27, the denominator alternative is more favorable. Here, the denominator is more favorable, but less so. Here, the denominator alternative is more favorable, but less so, and so on. Here, the, the two alternatives are the same. Here, the numerator uh, alternative is more favorable, even more favorable, even more favorable. And this shows the development of preference over 10 successive reinforcers. Up to now, we've looked at averages over sessions, average response rates. These are small time scale findings. And what you see is that uh, the preference develops uh, strongly for the preferred side, less strongly for the preferred, for the better side, and even less strongly for the better side, depending on how much better that side is. Are you with me on this? So if someone wanted to do that and came to me with this proposal, I said, Sully, you're really asking a lot from the theory. I mean, we have all these equilibrium results, and we're averaging over sessions in order to get them. You're asking for like really small time scale uh, uh, results from the theory? That's really asking a lot. Why don't you do this instead of suggesting something else? I don't even remember what it was. She said, nah, I'm going to do this. <laughs> Thank goodness she didn't listen to me. You yeah, that one? That's an artificial organism on the same kind of concurrent schedules. And you see preference developing over 10 successive reinforcers favoring the better spot. There is a, a, another aspect to this uh, kind of thing where you show over uh, three successive reinforcers the development of preference depending on which side gets reinforced. So right here, the top, the top alternative, these are logs of the left and right response ratios you see here. So they show preference. Right here, the left, the, the top alternative is reinforced. And then you've got, you, you start out at zero preference because that's, you don't know what schedule you're on when you start. After the first behavior, the first behavior is reinforced, you get an increase in this, the top behavior, you get the left behavior, you get an increase in preference here. If the next behavior is also on the top or on the left side, the preference increases further, and so on. If on the other hand, after if the first uh, reinforcer is for the left side, and then the second is for the right side, preference drops to here. And if the third one is also to the right side, it drops to here. So here you see uh, reinforcer by reinforcer development of preference in these interesting looking structures. This one is the same thing, except that the overall reinforcement rate is greater, and so the preferences are greater down here in the bottom. So this is even more finely detailed than the previous one. And this also Sully did this. Thank you, Sully. Uh, here's the theory. This is the theory on the napkin. Listen, there's nothing special that was done to get these results, these small scale results, or any of the results. It's the same simple theory. These are emergent say, structures, emergent outcomes of the evolutionary theory. And so uh, we can say that the behavior we observe and measure generated by evolutionary dynamics. So that's quite a lot of uh, evidence supporting the theory. The uh, qualitative uh, uh, human records, a lot of complicated equilibrium findings, these uh, small time scale results, that's a lot of evidence supporting the theory. But there's more. I mean, recently, uh, implemented punishment in the theory, and I'm not going to go into this in great detail. They're going to talk about punishment in Dublin in September. So if you happen to pop over there for the APAI international meeting, I'll talk more about punishment. We really just started punishment. We've got the summer results. We have a lot of interesting things that are happening, including a possible second order prediction of the theory, which is a prediction of what phenomena that have not yet been observed, which is an important way to confirm or disconfirm the theory. Um, but here's how we implement punishment in the theory now. Finally, we figured out how to do it so that it's the, the reasonable result. Well, here's the target class that's going to get punished. If that question is scheduled for that class, that class, uh, we call this forced mutation punishment. That class gets scanned, and every behavior in the class has a probability of undergoing mutation. 
Mutation can cause the behavior to leave the class, as you can imagine, or just move around in the class. So with enough forced mutation punishment, it's possible to reduce the number of behaviors in the target class, thereby making it less likely to be, be uh, uh, emitted in the next time step. And that's what punishment does. It reduces the frequency of behavior. The way, this is how we calculate the probability of punishment. This is the, uh, what I, I'll just call this, you don't really have to understand this in great detail. I can explain it to you in more detail on a separate day if you would like. Uh, but the, this, this quantity here is the context of reinforcement. So if the context of reinforcement is rich, which I mean, these are, these are, these are schedules where punishment is superimposed on a reinforcement schedule. If there's a lot of reinforcement in that schedule, the reinforcement context is rich, and punishment is going to be less effective. That's the assertion here. So the, this probability of punishment is going to be smaller when this quantity is large than when it's small. So when there are a lot of reinforcers there, punishment comes to say, I don't really care about the punishers. I really, I really like all these reinforcers. I'm not going to go way too much. If the reinforcement, reinforcement context is lean, and there aren't that many reinforcers, and I get a punisher, and I'm, I'm going to get out of here because I don't like these punishers, and I'm not getting much benefit from the reinforcers. So if you, you have, I call that reinforcement loss aversion, but Brian didn't like that because it was too con uh, convenient. Uh, uh, but uh, that's how we implemented punishment. And uh, here's some findings that we have from punishment. If you punish one alternative of a concurrent RI, RI schedule, here's the baseline where there's no punishment, and you get the same. Uh, these are single alternative schedules. You get the same response rate on the two sides here. These are 95% confidence in the people see here. Here we have the RI 20, 20 second schedule of punishment on the left, the blue. And you can see that the response rate goes down, but the response rate then goes up on the other unpunished alternative. And if you increase the punished rate of punishment on RI 12.5, the rate of responding goes down further on the punished alternative, goes up further on the other, and so on. These results are exactly what you see in my organism responding to a single alternative uh, equation, uh, uh, single alternative RI schedules that have superimposed punishment, exactly these results. Uh, here's an interesting finding uh, where we did, we did uh, Constant and equal punishment on both alternatives of the concurrent RI RI schedule is getting a little too esoteric, but um, it's, it's important. Uh, if you get constant and equal punishment, what people find is that the exponent of power function matching, because power function matching describes concurrent schedule performance. You have a baseline concurrent schedule, you get an exponent, and then you superimpose equal amount of frequencies of punishment on the two sides, fit the, fit the high, fit power function matching again, and look at the exponent, it's larger. Increases, and that's what we see here. Now, I believe that these these findings here also constitute a secular prediction of the theory that as you increase, this is the number, this is the frequency of punishment. As you increase the frequency of punishment, the exponent gets higher and higher and higher. I don't think there are data that show that. I think there are just data that show that. when you put some kind of punishment, equal punishment on two sides, you get a higher exponent. Um, so that's all I'm going to talk about. This shows what happens without. Really taking into account the reinforcement context, that's the open circles, it doesn't work. And that's, that's what I mean, that's for a long time in implementing punishment. We're trying to figure out this was the way to do it. We're doing a lot more really interesting things with punishment, superimposing punishment on, on, on uh, single alternative schedules. You may know about Bradshaw's of body and death, and we superimpose our high punishment and our hard punishment. We're working on that now. We're we'll talking about that at this point. And uh, those results are coming in nicely also. So there are additional results about punishment in this paper, J.R. Volume 112, 128, if you're interested. Oh, here I do talk about punishment on single, single schedules. Here's what happens in the time. Punishment on single schedules, this is the pressures of body and death, and they're human participants, and they were the first to really demonstrate effective ways to run human participants, by the way. They should get credit for that. They, they, really, they really had a great implementation, got great data, got great fits, and now people do the gradual and gradual at all. So these are old papers. Uh, so they superimpose DI and DR punishment on single DI schedules to the first time that In fact, they found differences in the parameters. What they found was that when you have the DI schedule, the, the asymptote K of the fit is closer to the asymptote when there's no punishment than when you implement DR punishment. So this is what this is what happens. These are actually for 
artificial organisms, but these findings for artificial organisms with the findings of red level have for live organisms. So this is one artificial organism, AO4, there's the baseline uh, response rate on our series of RI schedules. These are the same data points, this is the same AO. And here, there's superimposed VR punishment. And here, there's superimposed VR punishment. And you can see that it looks like the asymptote is much lower here than here, compliant to this right here. In fact, if we average over 10 AOs, these are the, these are the Ks. Uh, this is the baseline K. Uh, this is the K when the RI is punishment superimposed, when the RR punishment is superimposed. These are 95% uh, confidence intervals, so you see that you get the rational result. There's no difference in asymptote when you impose the RI punishment, but there is a difference when you impose the RR punishment. And what they also, this is for the AO stuff, but that's what, that's what rational results. And then they also found that the RCBs were larger when you superimpose punishment, but not different when you had VI versus the VR punishment. And so here's the, here's the RCB parameter when there's no punishment, the RI and the RR superimpose punishment, the 95% confidence interval. These are average over 10 AOs show that there's no difference between the RCBs, although they are larger than the baseline RCB as we expect them to be uh, based on human data. So, um, Yes, the behavior we observe that we measure is generated by evolutionary dynamics, seems like a reasonable statement to make. Uh, evidence supporting the theory has been published in 15 articles and counting. We're still working on it. So that's all the evidence here. Um, there are also many tested and untested predictions of the theory that have been, pu that have been published. The untested predictions are, as I said, second order predictions, or which are predictions of phenomena that have not yet been measured. So they constitute strong tests of the theory. They're out there in the world for anybody to see. You can run those studies to test those predictions, and there's a possibility there for this confirmed the theory. The prediction doesn't come out. Okay, so that's the evolutionary theory. Now I want to say something about how briefly how it corresponds to the material world. But I'll talk more about this uh, in this, this, this symposium this afternoon. And that's because, you know, binary uh, behaviors aren't integer or binary numbers. They don't reproduce. They don't undergo mutation. How in the world could they produce all these, all these results without any changes? How could, does that correspond to material reality? Well, these guys who I mentioned before all thought that the brain operates on evolutionary principles, and that's a possibility. Steve Brown and I discussed this in this article, Behavior and Philosophy, line 48, page 18, in case you're interested. But probably, I'm guessing that most of our scientists today would be skeptical that explanation of brain functioning. Consequently, what's, what happens if the brain doesn't really function that way, but you have to describe the brain in terms of biological phenomena and neurological phenomena. Uh, so we could say in that case that the operation of the evolutionary theory, the algorithmic operation of the evolutionary theory and the biological operation of the brain are computationally equivalent. That is, they give the same answers even though they operate in different Ways. Here's what computational, an example of computational equivalence is. I can ask, how did, what's the product of 15 and 3? Well, one way I can get that by writing 15 and 3 on a piece of paper, looking at my multiplication tables that I learned in fourth grade, 3 times 5 is 15, carry the 1, 1 plus 3 is 3 plus 1 is 4, and get 45. That's one way I can get that. Here's another way I can multiply 3 times 15. I can get three bottles, fill them each with 15 beads, pour the beads out on the table, and count them. And I'll get the answer 45. This is an example that's given by uh, uh, Richard Feynman, one of my great heroes, particle physicist, Nobel laureate. Um, this, is exa this is an example because this is the way quantum mechanics works. This is computational equivalence. So this is an example of computational equivalence. The operation is totally different, but I always get the same answer. So this could be the brain, and this could be the evolutionary theory, always giving the same answers. This is how quantum mechanics works. But in fact, there are three theories in quantum mechanics, all of which gives the same answers. They're all computationally equivalent. The Heisenberg matrix mechanics, Schrodinger wave equation, and the Dirac Feynman, that's not many Feynman, path integral formalism. They're totally different, but they give the same answers. And all three give the same answers as the natural world when you take measurements <coughs> in a uh, cyclotron or in the large network um, clock. So as Hobson Forshaw said in this, in this uh, 
Um, yeah, excellent. Their, their uh, part of the business is, is excellent book, Quantum Universe for the Ordinary Person. That uh, theory of nature, is purpose is to make predictions for quantities that, that can be compared to experimental results. Um, you, know, you don't have to produce a theory that bears any relation to the way we perceive the world at large. And they, and they, they argue that that's what quantum mechanics is. You know, what is beauty quark? Whoever saw that? What's a down quark? I don't know what a down quark is. But those are, those are important elements of the theory that produced, it's the most successful theory in the history of science, by the way, in terms of predicting that, being uh, agreed with measurements of many places of decimals on the theory. Um, so I'll talk more about, about that um, session and how, how that is a reasonable interpretation of the theory, I think. Um, now I want to say one or two things about uh, app clinical applications. Um, this is, uh, we looked at um, clinical applications to ADHD, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, and to uh, automatically reinforce self injurious behavior. Don't forget, there's a whole symposium on Monday about applications of this theory to severe problem behavior, including automatically self reinforced behavior. I mean, automatically reinforced self injurious behavior. Um, but the point of this is that you can create artificial organisms that have behavioral dysfunctions, like the ADHD. How do you do it? You increase the mutation rate. When you increase the mutation rate, you're getting behavior that's all over the place. You don't stay in the target range. You can change around and so on. If you put an AO with a high mutation rate on a concurrent schedule, you can look at the bouts of responding, how the changeovers are. And people, people study kids with ADHD on concurrent schedules. And Andre looked in detail at the behaviors of the AOs and the behaviors of the kids in terms of bout duration, switch frequency, and so on, and found really astonishing agreement between the details of the AO behavior and, and the behavior of the kids with the ADHD. Furthermore, um, that's what I mean by the second thing here. And um, furthermore, we know that we know that um, kids with ADHD on concurrent schedules have lower exponents than kids without ADHD, like 0.6 or something. Guess what? Same story with artificial organisms that have ADHD. Artificially reinforced self injurious behavior is a little bit more complicated. I'll, I'll let that some uh, group that uh, is studying that. It's Sam Morris up there, part of the Gang of Ten. And we published a paper on that, but there's going to be more detail about that, and it's really very so check in if you want to. What are the future directions? Stimulus control, delay discounting, um, navigating a 2D grid world. That's what artificial intelligence looks like. Being able to navigate the grid world in order to obtain a resource instead of just sitting in a box. And then this that is a prelude to animating mechanical agents with the theory of yes, animating mechanical agents. That's the robot of uh, Gerald Edelman's. He's animated with an evolutionary algorithm. And it uh, identifies different tops on those blocks. That's, that's uh, I won't tell you what that is, but that little spider on my phone. I want to leave time for, um, I'm going to leave time for questions and comments, so uh, we have some time to do that right now. Oh, by the way, here's another thing. The executables for this theory are available for you to use. So is the code available. Uh, and uh, Brian Clapes in the symposium on Monday, where we talk about applications to severe problem behavior, is going to give a tutorial on how to access our executable code so that you can run these studies yourself if you wish. So don't miss that. Or if you do visit, then uh, shoot um, Brian an email. Okay, so I want to end there and then uh, have time for questions.